This episode is brought to you by Audible. We often think of the Arctic as being cold and inhospitable, but in the future, folks may have warm memories of growing up there. Today we will be looking at colonizing our polar and tundra regions, borrowing from some of the techniques we discussed for colonizing icy planets and moons. In many ways the Arctic is the final frontier for humanity, nobody reached either the North or South Pole until the 20th century, and permanent outposts at either took a good deal longer. However, living in the frozen wastes themselves is hardly new. Our ancestors often went far north hunting and of course something has to live there to be hunted. It's hard to live up there, but many species have adapted to do so. Today we want to look at both how we could adapt to live there, and how we could adapt the Arctic to be more livable, and a bit of an in-between. When we talk about other planets we often distinguish colonizing methods between terraforming, making a planet more Earth-like, and bioforming making species able to live on a planet as is, but in all probability you'd often do a mix of both, and that's likely to be true of the Arctic too. There's a few ways you can approach this, you can enhance the Arctic while keeping it essentially the same ecologically, or you can alter its climate and ecology to match more temperate regions, it depends on your goal. Last time we talked about the deserts, whose oases harbor lots of life, and it's reasonable to assume we can make similar setups in the tundra. For instance, we might enclose a sizable chunk of land with a dome and heat and light it to provide food, akin to an oasis in a desert or a clearing in a forest. Alternatively, you can blast whole areas with orbital mirrors so it gets the same kind of lighting as the temperate regions. Which approach you take depends, again, on your goals and of course, your available technology. The Arctic is also a big and non-homogenous area with many different climates and environments already, and we don't have just one, there's the Arctic and the Antarctic, meaning near the bear and anti-bear land, while actually referring to the constellations, not the presence of polar bears, it gives you a good idea that they have very different environments. The Arctic has many ice-buried islands, but the Antarctic is an entire continent, and you'd want to take different approaches to each of them. You've got different motives for colonization too, the Antarctic is essentially a buried treasure with vast mineral resources, while the Arctic is more valuable for its oceanic and subterranean resources. These areas are also potential farmland, at least in marginal regions, they are cold and the ground is frozen in permafrost, and they don't get much light, but there is enough light if you can keep them warm. In many cases you need no active heating, just unfreezing the large reserves of greenhouse gases in the permafrost could heat up a domed over farm on its own. That only works on the edges though, as further in we need to actively heat and illuminate the enclosure. Some ecosystems don't benefit from being warmed either. A lot of oceanic ecosystems rely on krill and would break down if you warm the arctic waters too much. That seems counterintuitive, as warmer is generally better for life, warming waters would cause filter feeders such as krill to become more active, resulting in increased feeding on phytoplankton. However, since the amount of light hitting the ocean would remain the same, phytoplankton populations wouldn't be able to grow at comparable rates, this would result in a net depression of the total number of krill that could be supported, which could impact the rest of the food chain causing a drop in the total biomass in the ocean. Additionally in coral places, meltwater helps lift nutrients to those phytoplankton, who need both sunlight and nutrients, which are otherwise rarely mixed together in deeper seas. You could likely replace or tinker with a coral dependent ecosystem to get one that was heavier in biomass, but it's another example of unintended consequences of messing with complex dynamic systems warming up the cold regions of the ocean can result in them becoming barren. We have another issue with warming these regions up, and that's the ice sitting there. There is a lot of ice up there, and while ice floating on water can be melted without changing its volume all that much, ice on land is much more complex. Melt all the ice on land to get more land, and you flood a lot of other existing and valuable real estate, 
not to mention the ecological issues that would occur. I do want to take a moment to clarify that something I've noticed with a lot of debates on climate change is that there is often confusion about melting ice raising water levels. If I stick an ice cube in a glass of water, the water level does rise, and you'd expect it to rise more as the ice cube melted, but it doesn't. Ice has a lower density than water, and that's what causes a small part of it to surface when floating. A quick caveat though, ice is fresh water, the seas are salt water and thus slightly more dense, so when ice melts in them, you do get a slight net volume increase. It's not very large, but it's not zero either. The actual concern of course is about ice on land, rather than sea ice, as when it melts it won't have a net zero effect, and there's also a lot more of it. Floating Arctic ice is usually not very thick at a few meters deep, while the ice depth on Antarctica is a few kilometers. That's a lot more ice, and thus a lot more water. And of course that requires a caveat as well, because continents float too. We all float on a vast sea of magma, and if you pile a lot of mass on the mantle, it pushes down on it. Remove it and it will rise, though this rise is more like a cushion or mattress slowly returning to normal after someone stands up from sitting on it. Indeed the Arctic region is rising about a centimeter per year as they rebound from the Ice Age. Related to that matter, you also have to consider thermal expansion. Water expands when it freezes, but most materials expand when warmed. You also can't assume geology would remain static, since while most human activities have no real effect on volcanoes and earthquakes, shifting continents is probably an exception. You might also get water dumped down into the mantle, or even new volcanic hotspots. Fortunately, that would be pretty minimal, although there's evidence glaciers mitigate magma flow. However, It is a thing to keep in mind for later in the series when we will discuss intentionally moving continents. It's also why we always say, when it comes to terraforming other planets, by the time you're done, the place looks nothing like it used to, you're not just spray painting some green and blue on a planet. Needless to say, any sort of precision modeling of this is tricky at best, especially since it depends a lot on mantle viscosity and composition, and we're not too sure of that. Melt all the ice on the planet, and the overall coastlines will change an awful lot, but the specifics are way harder to calculate and that is part of why you often see differing figures on rising sea levels. Models change as we learn more, and we often find out a given effect was overlooked or exaggerated, or may be disputed in terms of severity of effect. We are still relative novices at climate and tectonic modeling. Of course being novices, one might argue that it's not terribly wise to mess around too much with what we have, and of course as we mentioned throughout the series, we are exploring the options available, not the ethics or wisdom of them. However, we do have some options for colonizing the Arctic that wouldn't melt everything, and similarly you'd presumably start small with things like this, even if you were planning to go all in down the road, so let's begin by looking at them. At the center of every ecology is the quantity of available energy, but we mostly mean food energy, not raw sunlight, even if the two are fairly intertwined. The home range for the typical polar bear is gigantic, literally tens of thousands of square kilometers, while a similarly sized carnivore in a temperate region needs mere hundreds, and a herbivore just a handful. We, alternatively, can support several individuals on just a kilometer of farmland using even rudimentary agricultural techniques, let alone what we can pump out from a climate controlled greenhouse using our best modern technology. Coming up with an economically viable source of energy to do this is another matter we'll address shortly, but if you have it, you can create small, warm oases which will not seriously impact local temperature or melt all our ice. Indeed, since it's critical to keep them well insulated to save power, and also to keep the whole place from sinking, the effect on the whole ecosystem would be minimal. Sinking is an issue when building Arctic outposts, incidentally you can sink into the ice slowly even if your connection to it is below freezing, but you'd rapidly melt through if your exterior temperature was above freezing, and if you're doing this on pack ice, you'll drop right into the ocean. A quick note on ice. You've got three main types of sea ice, 
drift ice, often called brash ice, which is small bits floating around, pack ice, which is the same only jammed together, and fast ice, which is fastened to the ground rather than floating. You've also got glacial ice, which accounts for most of our fresh water on Earth, and this would be on land or attached to it as a massive ice sheet. You've also got permafrost, areas where the ground is always frozen except for a seasonal thin layer at the top, and these are regions of interest for early colonization. For those warm oases, if you've got the energy and it's for people, you're fine as is. If it's intended to bolster local wildlife by increasing the food supply, things are a bit more complex. They need to be able to get in and out of those enclosures, and they also have to be focused on growing food the indigenous species can eat and which won't represent an invasive species. Entry is kind of tricky since sticking holes in something you are trying to insulate tends to be counterproductive, and tunnels will rapidly become hunting bottlenecks. We can also use a lot of tricks we've developed over the years for houses or grocery store freezers or doorways, like air curtains, to help keep the heat in, but you still have that bottleneck issue and end up with a polar bear camping in your entry tunnels. There's ways around this, and you could also make the whole thing basically a ship so that melting through the ice wasn't a problem, but you might still prefer some approach like having drones distribute that food over a wider range. If you've just got a few such places, they'd be nice for tourism since they attract the wildlife, and endless empty ice is much more boring to look at, but if you're making a lot of these places you might prefer they be almost entirely automated since not many folks would want to live there anyway. You might also go that anthropic ecology route we've mentioned a month back in the episode Environments of Space Habitats, where you treat the local flora and fauna to mesh better with an ecosystem that's essentially man-made and human-specific, akin to urban ecosystems but a bit more deliberate. There we use the example of crows or squirrels retrieving litter and turning in at depots in exchange for food, thus allowing a higher net density of wildlife by supplementing their food supply while also getting some work done for us. These don't have to be sea on land either, again you could make one a ship, or attach it under a chunk of floating ice. As an example, a big floating lens in the water would concentrate some light in the volume below it, creating a little boost in the local temperature and light availability. This is similar to the domes we discussed in Colonizing series, where you're just focusing the available light to concentrate it rather than adding energy. This is a decent approach if you just want small areas or pathways to be warm too. An often mentioned silver lining of the ice caps receding is that you could sail freighters or fishing boats along the northern coast of Eurasia, however, by just warming a narrow canal through the ice you'd achieve much of the benefit without the major climatic impacts. This concentrated light method only works for part of the year, both the days and the light intensity get very short as you go further north, and if you get far enough, end entirely during a dark season. You can't concentrate nothing. However, while the permafrost may stay frozen year-round in such places, if you go deep enough things will warm up, and you can use geothermal energy as your power source by drilling down, providing plenty of warmth and an electricity supply. There's not enough to thaw the whole place, but you could have large pylons bringing heat up to oases, or string them in a line along the coast to keep fast ice from forming on those and keep your sea lane clear. Nor are the depths of the earth the only place that's got a surplus of heat, though subterranean colonies up north is an option we'll explore later in the series. Last time we mentioned you could bring fresh water down to deserts by towing icebergs, but this need not be a one-way trip. You could build huge pipelines to act like radiators, bringing fresh water to hot deserts and warm salt water back up to the Arctic. We talked about doing something similar around the polar regions of Mercury to deal with its incredibly long day-night cycle and wide peak hot and cold temperatures. We've also talked about how to deal with the long day and night cycles on the moon or on the genuinely dark sides of tidally locked planets. The simplest answer would tend to be orbital meals, this is something we've discussed before and was even in the headlines recently as a suggested way of replacing streetlights. You hang a meal overhead and bounce light down on a city. 
That's a pretty bad idea itself, since street lighting is about safety, not agriculture or temperature, so it being blocked out whenever it's cloudy is a serious issue. However, you can light up a small area with one quite well, and we have two handy lesser known orbital paths that works well for this purpose, the Tundra Orbit and the Monia or Lightning Orbit. They are perfect for adding sunlight to high latitudes, and can also be configured to block sunlight at lower latitudes if you want to balance out how much light you're adding to the planet. Both orbits are eccentric elliptical ones that are angled well up above or below the equator, but the Tundra orbit is a bit less eccentric and geosynchronous, though not geostationary. It stays over the same general longitude of the Earth as it rotates, but moves north and south to describe a very lopsided figure 8. This lets it do something called Apogee Dwell, where it spends a much larger portion of its orbital period over an area. As you may recall, elliptical orbits do not have the orbiting object always moving at the same speed, when they are furthest away they move slowest. We call that furthest place the Apogee for Earth and Aphelion for the Sun. As it falls back down on its orbital path, getting closer, it speeds up until it reaches its closest approach to the object it orbits the perigee for Earth or perihelion for the Sun, then it begins to slow as it climbs back up and around to Apogee again. This highly cocked orbit provides a better angle at high latitudes, much the same as the Sun in the summer or equatorial regions. The Mornia orbit differs in that it orbits every 12 hours, and has a long Apogee dwell over some high latitudes. This is a very good way to shine light on places with very short days, or during their no light period. Of course our space-based warming method doesn't have to be done entirely with light. As we discussed with power satellites, beaming down microwaves lets you circumvent a lot of atmospheric interference, and it's fairly easy to convert that into heat energy. If you are driving most of your electricity from power satellites, you don't have to worry so much about greenhouse gas emissions either, and can even begin removing them. Plus, warming areas gives you something to do with power from such satellites if you have peak power usage times that require surplus capacity. That of course is one of the nice things about fission, fusion, and renewables too. With zero emissions energy, you can suck up carbon dioxide and water and convert them into hydrocarbons, making your plastics and gasoline carbon neutral. If one has access to significant stockpiles of fissionable materials, you do have another interesting option that is also handy for cord asteroids that we mostly skimmed over in colonizing series. Radioisotope thermoelectric generators are relatively easy to make, maintenance free, and long lasting, but their efficiency is low so most of the energy is lost as heat. Needless to say, lost as heat is a pretty relative term in the frozen Arctic. You could slap a dome up in the tundra with some nice sturdy LED lights, spectrum tailored for photosynthesis, and powered by an RTG in the basement whose waste heat is warming the ground. Something like that is basically maintenance free, there's just nothing in it that would be likely to break. Strontium-90, a waste product of fission with a half-life of 29 years, is almost ideal for this use. We can't say this setup is completely independent, but there's no need to bring in a continuous fuel supply. Greenhouses offer a nearly power-free option, though you obviously have capital investment and maintenance, ditto if you opt to throttle things up by including a passive geothermal system stretching down beneath the permafrost. As we've mentioned before, we do open-air farming now because we don't actually need that much farmland, our population has risen, but how much food we can get out of one chunk of land has risen too. If we want to keep increasing our numbers without adding to our farmland, we probably have to convert over to dedicated greenhouse facilities rather than open air farming. This comes with huge advantages in crop yield and water savings, plus helps to mitigate a lot of farming issues since it's a more controlled environment, but it isn't cheap to dome over and maintain that. However, it does instantly grant you a lot of new farmland since you can use them on land too arid or cold for normal crops. They trap moisture and heat, converting marginal areas into fertile ones, though you also have to build up your fertility since those spots don't really have decent soil initially. 
Since the construction cost is the same on good existing land, arid land, or tundra land, this would probably be where you start seeing a vast amount of greenhouse agriculture begin, desert and tundra. The land is cheap, and since not much lives there, you aren't doing as much damage, especially since you can take some of your yield to supplement the diets of the local critters whose territory you pull only a chunk of. This still is disrupting that local ecology a lot, but it's better than just clear-cutting a forest or jungle. It does come with one other issue though, trapped in all that permafrost is a ton of methane, and methane is a worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, about 25 times worse in terms of heat trapping potential, so amusingly you are better off torching the stuff rather than letting it get free into the air. However, this brings up an interesting silver lining. If we dome over a chunk of permafrost, thawing out some of the methane to drift into that dome, we can use its heat trapping ability to warm that dome even more, capture it to burn it for heat and electricity, and then use that dome, now warm and high in CO2 levels which many plants love, to sequester that carbon into new and healthy soil. It's debatable if releasing that methane even in this controlled way is beneficial, but since it seems likely to be released anyway, you might as well profit while minimizing the damage, and convert those areas into more livable places. We can also offset its release through our aforementioned Arctic Carbon Capturing. This is also assuming you want to live on the surface, or do agriculture in Alaska, or build beach resorts on the northern shores of Siberia. However, we mentioned that these places have a lot of unexploited mineral wealth, and we have hundreds of underground lakes in Antarctica, and some with life in them. Lake Vostok, the largest of them, has a huge volume, beating out every one of the Great Lakes except Lake Superior, and hosts a lot of strange and unique life. It's also very easy to tunnel through ice, and very easy to insulate inside it to maintain a decent temperature. There's also no sunlight for a lot of the year in Antarctica, and the sun never sets for much of it too, so an underground city in an ice cavern, presumably for mining, might be appealing as you don't really have a decent natural day-night cycle there anyway. It's not as cold either, since you stay at right around freezing when buried deep in ice, avoiding the atrocious sub-zero temperatures you get on the surface. Needless to say, cold can be advantageous too, as we've noted before for manufacturing and computing. The handy thing about tunnels and cavern cities is it doesn't much matter what latitude you put them at, and if they release a little heat up to the areas above, it's beneficial to the local ecosystem. We'll discuss those more next time though. One last approach that ice caverns and underground living suggest though is to make the ice deeper. If water levels rising from ice melt is our biggest concern, and keeping in mind that in Antarctica at least, most of the central surface is essentially devoid of life, we might decide to increase that big, kilometers thick ice sheet by pumping more water there to freeze in an ever-growing mountain. And this trick also works on mountains which have glaciers on them even in equatorial latitudes. They'll keep melting, and more so as you add mass on top to push on them, but you can keep pumping and stay ahead, growing the things, and indeed you could build them in a framework to stack them higher and stronger. Think of the wall in the north from Game of Thrones, built of ice and gravel, or Pycrete, ice mixed with fibers that makes it very strong, which we've discussed using as a construction material in colonizing icy planetoids. The taller you go, the more energy is needed to pump the water there, but the easier it is to get the water to freeze. We've discussed using very deep artificial cisterns for storing excess water earlier in the series, this is the other approach, storing it in giant ice mountains, potentially with frameworks and small ice cavern cities inside, maybe even ones that slowly melt their way up to stay near the top. As we can see, there are lots of options for colonizing our coral climates, sadly though there's not a lot of decent science fiction on the topic. It seems like authors tend to use the polar regions as a backdrop, a cold and hostile place that intensifies the danger the protagonist is in. This often makes for some great fiction, indeed two of our books of the month for this year were set in Antarctica, H.P. Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness and John W. Campbell's Who Goes There, aka The Thing. 
I wanted something a bit more upbeat for the end of the year, and with us recently looking at Flat Earths and discussing Santa Claus machines next week, it seems a great time to finally give the Book of the Month to Sir Terry Pratchett, author of the Amazing Discworld series, and his novel The Hogfather, a fun winter wonderland tale of the Discworld's parallel for Santa Claus, the Hogfather, going missing and the Grim Reaper having to take his place. Discworld is a fantasy parody series covering around 40 books, so you'll have no shortage of extra reading if you enjoy the book, and The Hogfather is one of my personal favorites. Sky One also made a movie for it, and there's been a few other TV and film creations from the series. If you'd like to grab a free copy of The Hogfather, just use my link in the episode's description, audible.com slash Isaac, or text Isaac to 500 to get a free book and a 30 day free trial. I have literally never met anyone who didn't enjoy the Discord series once they got into it, but if you should happen to be a forced, you can exchange it for another book free of charge. So speaking of Santa, our last episode before he sets off with his reindeer will be on Santa Claus and Cornucopia machines, the catch-all terms for devices that can make just about anything, like the replicators from Star Trek. Next week we'll explore the possibilities of, and societal impact of, such devices, and look at some of our technologies developing in that direction, like 3D printing, and some of the challenges we face in improving them. We will then close out the fourth year here on SFIA on December 27th with a look at colonizing the stars with technologies like that and the seed and data ships concepts we've mentioned as alternatives to generation ships in Seeding the Stars. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.